Nicola Goddard. She was a captain, a Canadian, a daughter. But she died doing something she believed was important. She wanted to make a difference. She knew it came with a risk. This was sent by her colleagues. Tonight, you'll hear from her family. What they call the last round. The soldiers she commanded. And for the first time, what they now say about her death. The body of Captain Nicola Goddard arrived in the back of a Lab 3. She would be the first degree. There's 157 other people that didn't come home, so. Nicola Goddard hoped to leave the world a little better than she found it. And you'll see what that means to a new generation of Canadians. She risked her life and she died just because she wanted to help out. The life and death of Nicola Goddard in the words of a soldier. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge. We're here at the National War Memorial in Ottawa, a place where Canadians pay tribute to the sacrifices of war. And it is also in Ottawa that many of our war dead and veterans choose to be buried comrades in life paying tribute to one another in death. Over 3,000 of our war dead and veterans are buried near here at Beechwood Cemetery, each with a story of why they entered service and the legacy they left behind. Tonight, we tell you just one of those stories. It was in May 2006 that Captain Nicola Goddard became the 16th Canadian soldier to be killed in Afghanistan. During her time there, Captain Goddard wrote in detail about what she saw and why she wanted to serve. You'll hear from those letters tonight, the words of a soldier telling the story of all soldiers. But we start this special hour with Nicola's parents. Here's the CBC's Red Sharon. Welcome to the island. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Hi there. Hello. This is Kaylee. Hi, Kaylee. Tim and Sally Goddard's house is a museum of their travels, a testament to their life's work. Birch bark biting from uh, from Nod, Saskatchewan. Oh, wow. uh, you got stuff from all over here. Yep. Pilots into the Pacific. And this is a war shield. The walls are covered with touchstones. Drum, it's a caribou hide uh, from uh, Black Light. From Saskatchewan to Papua New Guinea. And pictures of their three girls, Kate, Victoria, and their first, Nicola, who was born there. Upstairs in the guest room, there's a quilt covered in maple leaves. That's lovely, eh? For families of the fallen. Right. Um, oh, look at that. Yeah. So this is in her memory. Yes. Their Nicola became Captain Nicola Goddard of the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. We decided that rather than having it in a cupboard, we would actually use it. In a quiet spot in the basement, just, people just felt moved to send people things. People got moved, sent things. Other memories. Brigade Commander General Habibi gave us this. Yeah, yes, so the Afghan yeah, army yeah. with whom she worked. This is, this is the actual the aerial yeah. shot where it happened and boxes full of emotion that six years later are still very hard to open. Because at the age of 26, their Captain Nicola Goddard became the first Canadian woman killed in combat. This was sent by her colleagues. This is um, what they call the last round. So it was fired in her honor? It says fired in her honor. She was funny. She had a great laugh. You know, she was, um, she was what, you know, you'd want every child to be. She was very much her own little person. She was, completely. 
Nicola Kathleen Sarah Goddard, a breech baby, weighed just four pounds when she arrived in Papua New Guinea on May 2, 1980. But she was tough, fitting right in with the other children on this small island state, sometimes giving her parents, who were teaching there, all they could handle. I remember once I went down to the village to pick her up after school and um, she was sitting there, she was what, two and a half, with a coconut and a, a bush knife, a machete, like almost as big as she was, cracking this coconut. As the family grew, they moved to northern Canada. Nicola and her sisters, Victoria, and then later Kate, were very close. Nicola liked to take care of them. She was the protector. She was completely unafraid. And as you know, we moved around a lot. And uh, she always looked on moving as a big adventure. She was um, free thinking. She, she knew what she wanted. She'd go after it. She was like her dad in many ways. She was stubborn. You know, she would believe in something and, and then go for that. It was while finishing high school in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, after speaking with a recruiter, that Nicola decided what she wanted. She wanted the adventure of a military career. For her teacher parents, self-described peace activists, it landed like a bit of a bomb. So how did it sit with Dad? It was hard. It was hard, yeah. I, um, I don't know if I tried to talk her out of it. Um, I think we tried to show her different options, different, different things that, that were available. And, um, but she, she felt she wanted to try it, and so, you know, well, okay. Mom Sally tried to put the best face she could on it. You didn't see herself putting herself directly in harm's no. way, as it were? No, not at all. Yeah. You know, she'd do peacekeeping for a few years and wear a blue beret, and we'd be proud of her. Nicola excelled, showing strong leadership skills, holding more than her own with her mostly male fellow cadets. But as she was about to complete her training, it was clear the world and the future role of the Canadian military is about to change. <gasps> oh my goodness. Oh God. It's all out war. <laughs> this is just a horrific scene and a horrific moment. After 9-11, it was clear nothing would be the same. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. An ally of America in its new war on terror, the implications started to reach the Goddard household. Was there a moment where you went, wait a minute. Oh yeah. She, she could be in real trouble. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that, was, that was there. I mean, um, when she'd come back and talk about, well, we had um, you know, this particular exercise or we were using how we were learning how to use uh, chemical warfare suits mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, and you, and you know, well, this is, if you're learning how to use them, there's somebody somewhere has thought that might be a potential hazard that you're going to face. Still, Nicola graduated in 2002, optimistic about the future. She had met husband Jason Beam at military college, but as they embarked on a new life together, events in the world would soon wash over them. We have been involved in the capturing of prisoners, yes. It started with the defense minister admitting to a secret mission by JTF-2 commandos working with the Americans in Afghanistan. The role of the Canadian military had shifted from peacekeeping to combat. Soon, close to 2,500 Canadian troops would be on Afghan soil. The fighting would become intense. Suicide bombings in the streets became common. Canadian soldiers started coming home in coffins. Nicola and her peacekeeping father, who had spent his life trying to affect change through education, not violence, argued about Canada's new role. She said, you know, you, you can't do stuff that you're doing, Dad, if there were people shooting at you and blowing up the schools and so on. You've got to have people like me 
finishing, getting, getting everything calm first. So she was talking about the fact that you, if you don't have that civil society, um, and um, then you can't do the work. And uh, yeah, I do what I do so that you can do what you do. And uh, there's a certain ring to that. I mean, uh, hard as it is as a educator to accept that you yeah. need to have that. She won that argument with she Ted. Did, absolutely, yeah. The one thing that Tim held on to was that Nicola was near the end of her five-year commitment to the military. Instead of Afghanistan, she could have walked away, but she didn't. She made the decision and, and um, phoned one night and said, well, I've, I've signed on. I'm, I'm a lifer now. That was uh, the language she used. We spent Christmas with Tim's mother in England, in Wales, and uh, she spread a map of Afghanistan out on the table and explained where she was going and what she was doing. She made a will. She had envelopes with um, the addresses of how to get mail to her and how we were, everything was planned. And that was, that was the thing that, that I think to a certain extent shook us. Tim and Sally did some planning of their own. We wanted phones in every room so that we wouldn't miss a call. I wouldn't say I had second sight. I knew something horrible was going to happen or anything like that. Um, but you were uneasy. But I'm uneasy, yeah. I was uneasy. Reg will be back a little later with an inspiring next chapter for the Goddard family. But coming up, remembering the boss, we'll hear from the soldiers led by Captain Goddard who were with her that fateful day. I, I could see she was bleeding. Um, I, I, I put two and two together. I knew and throughout her. this hour, Nicola Goddard, in her own words, she loved to write letters home. We've asked students from a Calgary school named in her honor to help us out. Hi, my name is Deanna Sale. I'm in grade eight and I'm at Captain Nicola Goddard School. Hi, my name is Susanna Zaldana. I'm in grade seven. Hello, my name is Julio and I'm in grade four. My name is Audrey Yoon. I'm in grade six and I go to Captain Nicola Goddard School. I'm afraid that this week's letter won't be neat or long, nor particularly cheerful. I don't want you to feel that I am depressed or defeated. Far from it. I just have to believe we are doing a good thing. The longer that we are in theater and the more that we actually interact with the Afghan people, the more I feel that we are serving a purpose here. Our morale is pretty high and we are keeping very busy. It is an amazing feeling to get out and actually do our job. It is truly an honor to be wearing this uniform overseas. There is nowhere else I'd rather be right now. The words of a soldier from a letter written by Captain Nicola Goddard. In May 2006, she was killed in combat. At the time, she was leading a team in southern Afghanistan. There were four other soldiers on her crew. This is their story. And this was kind of, I think it was at the beginning of the tour. They, uh, they them along with parts of the other company, uh, climbed one of these mountains that we were uh, looking for bad guys in. And even when they got to the top of the mountain, um, there she is with a big shit-eating grin on her face. She was pretty tough, driven, motivated. Uh, and always upbeat. She would always smile.
Oye, 